More than 10 million people, disproportionately people of color, especially African Americans, have been evicted from their homes in just the last six years. That's the same number of people as live in the whole state of Michigan. And yet at the same time, a rise in home prices is being touted as an example of a housing recovery. So who's recovering? What exactly? Our next guest says this so-called housing crisis isn't the product of a year or two of loan sharking and bad borrowing. It's the latest chapter in the nation's long-lived civil rights struggle. Laura Godestina is here today to talk about her book just out from Zuccotti Park Press. The title is A Dream Foreclosed, Black Americans and the Fight for a Place to Call Home. Laura, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start at the very top. Where are we now? Then we'll get to where this all began, because it wasn't just a three-year project. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Where we are now is we're experiencing this huge rupture in the narrative versus what's actually happening. We are hearing every day when we pick up the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, when we listen to President Obama speaking in Phoenix, we're hearing about this massive housing recovery. When we talk about a housing recovery, what we're talking about is the rising value of home prices. What we're not talking about necessarily is a stabilization of communities that have been really hard hit by the foreclosure crisis or the families that have been displaced over the last six years. So people who own housing assets may see something like a recovery, but the people who actually live in homes or want to stay there may not. Exactly. Particularly people who are renting, for them, spiking home prices is just spiking their rental payments, which means if you were a homeowner who was displaced through foreclosure through the crisis, you were thrown out, you don't have great credit, you probably don't have a lot of savings. Right now, you're paying more than ever to keep your family sheltered. But the biggest thing that we're experiencing, and it's the one that's been almost no reporting on, is that this drive in home values, this rising home prices that we're experiencing, isn't largely being driven by new families who are buying their first home. It's largely being driven by huge head funds and huge private equity companies who are going into neighborhoods and buying up hundreds, sometimes thousands of foreclosed properties in any individual city. So for example, the Blackstone Group, which is one of the largest private equity companies in the entire world, they've spent more than $4.5 billion in the last year alone, simply snatching up tens of thousands of foreclosed properties. Now they're holding on to them, they're expecting that home values are going to rise and they can flip them and sell them for a profit. But that doesn't mean that on the ground, families, regular ordinary Americans, are necessarily experiencing a recovery. And did I read at the end of your book that Walmart and Costco are getting into the subprime loan business? Right. So that was some reporting by the New York Times that came out a little a few months ago. And it was explaining how because credit has been tightened, because the banks have been nervous over the last few years as a result of the collapse to be lending again, other major industry players, Walmart, Costco, and these other huge box stores have started to get into the game of extending mortgages. So what we're not seeing, just to reiterate, is m safe mortgages being on the market and aggressive government action to help the people who have been foreclosed or who are at risk of foreclosure. More than a million loans are still at risk of being foreclosed, which means you know, m more than a few million people could still be thrown out of their homes. What we're simply seeing is that the prices and the turnover of loans, that's improving now. And so we talk about a recovery, but it's really a Wall Street recovery. But what has happened? I mean, going back to 2008, you had the Bush administration authorizing the first TARP, Troubled Assets mm -hmm. Relief Program, if I remember it right. Obama followed that with more bills that were supposed to help more homeowners. Um, and now we have the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Right. Is none of this stuff helping? I can't say, I won't sit here and say none of it has helped at all, but it hasn't helped at all to the extent that it has been projected or it has been promised to help. For example, HAMP, which is the part of TARP that was supposed to go straight to homeowners, almost none of that money was spent. Obama said it was going to help millions, approximately five million families. It didn't help near that, maybe a million. One of, the, one of the scariest to me examples of how this money has been misallocated and not spent is how the hardest hit fund was spent. And the hardest hit fund was supposed to go to communities and states that were hit the hardest. You know, California, Michigan, Rhode Island, Florida, Nevada. 
What happened was this money was held by states in a lot of cases and not spent. And now, recently, for example, Detroit and cities across Michigan started to spend that hardest hit money in order to actually tear down vacant properties where the family had already been forced out through foreclosure. And so had it been spent earlier, had it been used more aggressively, those families would still be in those homes. Those cities would have no need to tear down vacant properties that are blighting the neighborhood, that are creating crime, that are dragging down property values. Yet now we have this paradoxical situation where money that was supposed to help families is simply being used mm. for demolition. How did you get into following this story and producing yeah. this extraordinary book? I was so inspired by the way that Occupy Wall Street in New York, you know, occupying Zuccotti Park, I was living there, I was working in the kitchen, how it was speaking about our need to relocate, you know, to stand our ground in, in mm. the right sense of that term as ordinary people living in this country, to say, hey, we actually are the center of this country. Mm -hmm. The banks, their narrative, that's not the center of the country. That's not the priorities. After we were evicted from the park by the police in coordination with Homeland Security, I had started to hear stories about that very same tactic of occupying space, of refusing to leave, of claiming to be central to the narrative of this country was happening in communities all over the country. We actually covered a housing reclamation, and we had right. been covering them for years by groups like uh, Right to the City and Reclaim the Land. Mm -hmm. Right, Right to the City, Take Back the Land, back the land. Chicago anti-eviction campaign, moratorium now. I mean, they were doing this. That's the important thing that people don't know. It didn't start with Occupy. Take Back the Land started in 2006. Right. They've been doing this moratorium now up in Detroit, doing this through most of the 2000s. What Occupy did do, was it reinvigorated it. And I think it invigorated a movement for eviction defense and also home liberation. And it tied it into this broader narrative in which, you know, we're not considered, we as human beings, central to the priorities of this country. Now you tie this crisis of these last few years into a bigger narrative mm -hmm. too. You tie it into the history well, into American history over the last 200 years. You even go back into the model of private home ownership in this country and how that kind of conflicted with the interests of populations that found themselves having to deal with that system. Yeah. African Americans, Native Americans, all sorts of people. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this broader narrative. We don't like to remember it, is the truth of the matter. But what I really wanted to do with this book is explain how a functioning democratic system cannot necessarily work with a system of private property that is based on exclusion and that could yield crises like the one that we just experienced in which 10 million, Amer 10 million Americans, 10 million people are thrown out of but their homes. But what do you mean by based on exclusion? I mean, the mythology of this country is as a place for everybody, go mm -hmm. west young man or woman. Um, home ownership is more attainable here than in many of the countries people have come from. Well, not go yet go west young woman, for example, because it didn't really matter if you were a woman in that era. It didn't matter if you were any person that was not white, if you were a woman, but more than anything else, if you didn't own private property at the founding of this country, you could not vote. You could not access that original promise of this country, which was democracy. Fast forward, you know, 200 years, we're still experiencing essentially that same phenomenon, except it's gotten more diffuse. So for example, if we go back to the example of Detroit, they recently were completely stripped in that city, all 700,000 residents of that city, of their local democratic rights. Why? Because the governor imposed an emergency manager. Why? Because the, cr the, the finances of that city had collapsed and they collapsed, and we don't like to talk about this, because the city has suffered 100,000 foreclosures, mm. completed foreclosures in the last decade. That means they've experienced a forced population migration larger than the city of New Orleans after Katrina experienced. It's a great point, because you're also putting your finger on the fact that cities change mm -hmm. and the fate of neighborhoods changes not just at the whim of a population that moves in or moves out or the weather or the traffic, um, but policy. Right. Well, How is what we're seeing on. now related to redlining? Well, what was redlining for people that don't remember it or know it? So redlining was the federal housing administrations, meaning the section of the government, the federal government that was charged with dealing with housing. It was their policy of taking huge maps of the United States 
and drawing red markered lines around any neighborhood in which people of color, so anyone who is not white, live. And when was this happening? Pretty much all throughout the 20th century. It was legally stopped in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act and then the Fair Landing Act in 77. But this was the dominant housing policy of the 20th century. And what it yielded was a situation in which the government would only extend or back, meaning guarantee, credit, lending, in communities that were white. And if you didn't live in a community that was white or you weren't white, you couldn't access any of the credit, any of the promise of home ownership, any of the mobility that we consider so near and dear in this country. Now, are you, um, is there any nuance in this? Is it really as, well, for lack of a better word, black and white as it sounds? It was essentially as black and white as it sounds. For example, Detroit, again, they had to construct at one point a developer wanted funding for an all white community wanted to build a new subdivision. He said, listen, it's gonna be for only whites. There was lots of housing covenants that said, this community, Levittown, all of these new communities, only for white people. The Federal Housing Administration looked at their map and said, but that's adjacent to an African American neighborhood. You can't build there. It might be infiltrated with, quote, disharmonious racial groups. Yeah, that was actually the wording they used. So what he had to do to secure this funding was build a wall, you know, six feet high, a foot thick, half a mile long, running in between this African American neighborhood and where he wanted to build his white subdivision. It really was literally cut and dry black and white walls. And where do we stand now? I mean, we had the 60s. Right. We've been celebrating 50 years of civil rights right. struggle. We had the Fair, Labor, the Fair um, Housing Act. We had the Fair Lending Act. Mm -hmm. um, why haven't there been more, or how come we're still in a situation where the crisis that we've just lived through and for some people it was much longer than for others, um, we saw African Americans lose, I think, more than half of their accumulated wealth yep. since Reconstruction? Yes, so what happened as a result of the organizing in the 60s, the 70s, to strike down a lot of this legislation? was it opened up neighborhoods to credit. And that was a really good thing. And any conservative or libertarian who says that was the problem with this current crisis is wrong. They're manipulating history. Who did manipulate the crisis was Wall Street and these huge banks and these massive mortgage lending companies. And what they did was they looked at communities that had been redlined, communities that had been starved of credit for almost all of the 20th century. And they said, ah, well, that's an opportunity. Those are people who desperately need mortgages who have never had access to them. And so the banks exploited our nation's history of institutional and legalized racism in order to turn mm -hmm. a very quick profit. We spoke a few years ago in 2009 with a whistleblower who had previously been one of the star mortgage agents mm -hmm. for Wells Fargo in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. The city of Baltimore at the time was suing Wells Fargo around racist um, mortgage practices. Are we working hard to get beyond this now? <laughs> it's a great question. I think what we're seeing is we're we're constantly seeing the tactics of creating wealth off of exploitation and off of institutionalized racism shifting. So for example, when we started this segment with the work of Blackstone groups and the snapping up of foreclosed properties, what we're seeing in that moment is very similar to what we saw during the crisis, which essentially amounts to a huge land and wealth transfer. And any time, and I think it, it's sort of obvious, any time you see a lot of wealth and a lot of land moving from lower and middle class people and being consolidated by huge financial institutions comprised of shareholders who are upper class people, we can understand that we're having reverse redistribution. We don't need reverse redistribution. We need real redistribution. Mm. Now, and what do you say to the people at Walmart and Costco? We talked about them offering yeah. um, mortgages earlier that they say, listen, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make mortgages more available to more people at more affordable prices. It really just depends on the terms. So if you are selling a you know, ballooning mortgage, for example, you know, one of the women in the book, in the book starts with a mortgage, a second mortgage, $40,000. Within a few years, she owes $190,000. You're starting to deal with an adjustable rate ballooning mortgage with those types of predatory terms. That's not making anything more affordable or accessible for anybody. And you're exploiting people who don't necessarily have the legal access to 
lawyers and to people who can advise them on these issues. And is that the next story you're going to be looking into? I'm going to be looking into what is being sold now and what is happening as a result of you know Blackstone Group and other hedge funds and other private equity companies moving into this market. I really want to see, and we're not seeing enough reporting about that on the ground. Well, I'm really glad you're out there. Laura Godestina is the author of a brand new book, A Dream Foreclosed, just out from Zuccotti Park Press. We have a link at our website.